Welcome back. It's Tuesday, April 14th. Is that right? That is correct. Day 22. Wow. So as promised, we invited back Mark Fetterman from Eastside Community High School in New York. It's actually community school because it's great. Yeah. yeah, community yeah. school, but it goes by both names. We'll, we'll take it. We'll take either. Well, you know, when I came to visit, I went to the wrong school and wound around. They were like, no, no, you've got the wrong address. It's down there farther. Um, but it's a beautiful little place tucked in a neighborhood. Um, I was really interested. Our teachers respond on Flipgrid to what you said last time we talked to you. And several of them mentioned that they were so inspired that a leader believed in what they believe in, that they have never felt that in their schools, have <laughs> never been supported, that it was like one teacher said something to the effect of just to know it's possible mm -hmm. made a difference to her. And I think that you need to know that that is also what you represented to me. When I walked through your building, it was like, this is what it can be. And I think that is such a gift to the world. And I want to thank you for just giving us more of your time. Well, no, thank you. And that's great. Great to hear. So I appreciate it a lot. So we thought we would start today. Um, we have a lot of teachers asking about distance learning. And I did a lot of work this morning just reading about what people are trying and thinking about. And I just wondered if you could um, help us think in two different ways about this question. One, what are your teachers doing to support the reading and writing and thinking of kids? But what are you doing to support them in this new place? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, if I can start off with before even the reading and writing work starts to take place is just the idea of getting your community set up. Uh, we are in an interesting, uh, New York City's interesting place. Uh, we're at a school that has two thirds of our students are eligible for Title I services, meaning you know they get free uh, access to free lunch. And we've got a third of our students fit into middle class um, areas. But uh, New York City, as we all know, anybody who knows New York City, even families that are middle, middle class are struggling to pay the rent and get by and it's, you know, it's not, it's, it, it's, it's a little bit of a tough life economically. So for us, when we made the switch, we, the first thing we just immediately talked about and thought about was the idea of equity, the idea of how are we going to do, and it was really looking at mostly online learning, you know, there wasn't a chance to send packets or books. We, we actually did send some books home with, as we sensed it happening, we sent a bunch of kids home with, we asked them to take two weeks worth of books home. Now I wish we had asked them to take six weeks worth of books over <laughs> three months now it's looking. Uh, so we asked them to raid the library and our library and Andrew was great and helped everybody and the teachers helped them get the kids get books. And then we also tried to hand out as many laptops as we could, as we saw that this was going to come because we were going to shift to remote learning a little bit earlier because we wanted to give some students the chance to stay home because families were worried. Um, and then when the shift took place officially, the, the idea, the goal was really how can we get every single child in the school with either a laptop or some sort of device that they could work on, make sure that they had Wi-Fi. So really for a lot of us, the first week or two, the first week was making sure not just the school leaders, but of course the school leaders and support staff, but even all the teachers and all teachers act as advisors, really making sure that every child in the school had access to some sort of, of, of device that they, they, could, they could do their work on and, and are arguably read on. And then that switched to, once we got that going in, we were, I was, we're, our community was pretty remarkable. I mean, people just stepped up, we did what we needed to do. The DOE had some iPads in place and we were able to get some of those eventually, but we were really kind of ahead of the game. Uh, and I was, I was really proud of our community. But then what we sh quickly shifted in into the literacy part was, okay, so how is everybody gonna read? So hopefully they've brought some books home, but did everybody do that? We have some families and some kids who've got, you know, shelves worth of books or can even go on Amazon and order books. Uh, maybe their parents have a lot of books in their house and they can grab those. We have other students who, you know, don't have as many books or they've read all their books or they, um, they, then they don't have a Kindle or a reading device. They don't have a way to just, you know, the means to, to order books. So we immediately um, implemented a reading survey as well as some follow-up calls and, and outreach to kind of check to make sure that every child in the school had, we, it asks us questions like how many weeks of books do you have? Do you have a reading device? What's it like? Do you have access to Wi-Fi, which is what we were still kind of working on? Um, do you have the means to buy books? Do you have the means to donate books to help other students? Or uh, uh, we got Kindle accounts that we can use. Uh, so we, 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 we had a teacher write a grant to get 50 free Kindles and she got 50 free Kindles donated. We, 
put mm -hmm. aside other money and, and raise their money with some help of some parents and some other people to get 50 more Kindles. So at this point right now, and this is we're, we're, this is like, I mean, talk about like, this is really, like, this is happening literally as I speak right now. I have my librarian at the post office texting me about uh, the school credit card and making sure we can use that and we're putting out money to go mail these devices out. But so the idea right now is that we're in the stage of getting every child um, just a way, how are you going to sustain, how are you going to maintain your reading for the next three months and making sure everybody in the school has that and we're working on that checklist. We're not there yet, but we're feeling, we're making a lot of progress. And, and again, it goes back to our conversation last week, like during this time of this crisis and this, 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 new, new, this new world that we're all living in, what, what is a priority? Obviously the health and well-being of all our families, making sure they're safe, which is a lot of the original outreach in addition to obviously checking on their, their Wi-Fi and computers. Um, and then the, one of the next questions we asked ourselves was how can we make sure that everybody's going to be able to s sustain reading both because of, again, like we talked about last week, the skills and the, you know, just to be able to continue to grow as a reader, but also for the social emotional support and, and, um, and space that it can provide for, for our young people and families. Hmm. So, so once, they, once you determine that most of your kids have reading materials, then what? Okay, so there's, yeah, and a lot of that is now being geared through a combination of us maintaining independent reading and, and what that's looking like in different English classrooms. So some of our teachers early on, and again, I think you've probably heard this both from the people you've spoken with as well as your own, your own world. Uh, teachers, teachers, some of our best reading teachers are not as tech savvy as, you know, uh, as um, some of our other teachers. And, you know, so, so what we've done is we've learned a lot quickly and we started, so some teachers started using Flipgrid right away where kids can do a book talk or share a book talk. Other teachers um, are reaching out and doing one-on-one -on -one reading with students who they're worried about, you know, and, and also you have to, at this point, you have to kind of both divide and conquer as well as decide who needs your immediate attention. So students who we know are the, are independent reading, um, ind really, really independent readers in the sense that they just, we know that they have the books and they're gonna read. Uh, we give them a little bit of space. They can throw something on Flipgrid. They can do some reading responses, uh, but we're not rushing to have a reading conference or, you know, uh, with them immediately. We're, uh, so we're asking everybody to put something on Flipgrid in those classes and we're spreading that throughout the school. Um, but then for the students that we're worried may not have the materials or may just need that kind of extra support, one-on-one -on -one reading conferences from English teachers, uh, learning specialists reaching out. Um, we have a reading specialist in the school as well who just works with our students who are really struggling. Um, with, with basic um, fluency and decoding. So she's been doing one-on-one -on -one reading with, with students and reaching out to those students. So a lot of that outreach and kind of that's the early stage. And what we've been doing is having English department meetings, which have been sharing best practices. So teachers are stealing ideas from each other. So when a couple of teachers had live um, publishing ceremonies or got small groups where students could share read their, their creative writing pieces, and that was really special, and I got to sit on a couple of those. We had a, a share where kids, um, another grade did both a combination of live reading, as well as they would publish on a Google Doc their writing, and students would come in and comment. So, you know, the same kind of going around reading, we would go from desk to desk, reading each other's stories and sharing, had that more in a combination of platforms, some live and some um, online. So we're sharing those ideas with each other and basically stealing and, and, and learning as, as we go. And again, with this idea of how do we keep this reading and writing experience, which in some ways is so personal to, to our young people, but in other ways is also such a social part of hopefully, you know, our school and hopefully our lives. And how do we kind of get the best out of this? But it's, it's still very much a work in progress, as you, you can imagine. So my guess is that, you know, in those classrooms where these practices were regular, these practices were... Uh, sort of institutionalized, like we read every day, we write every day, that that transition is a lot easier. I, I found it with my own students, you know, the students that I have right now who are responding uh, are the kids who are really in that daily reading and writing groove. And yesterday I taught a class online where we, we, we read a piece together uh, and then we quick wrote and then we revised and then we shared. And it, there was a comfort there because it was really just like what we do in a regular classroom. It's not like uh, you know, you have this new set of circumstances, but it doesn't mean that the basics of reading and writing and talking about your reading and writing sh shift. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's something that I feel, I think we're very fortunate about. And I, I, I'm watching so much that's happening all, you know, everywhere right now. And we feel grateful 
for the community that we have and specifically around the, the culture and expectation that we have with students around reading and writing. Just like you said, if, you, if, it, if a student feels comfortable and is a, with the expectation of reading and writing and thinking about their reading and sharing, you know, sharing what they're talking about their reading, they're gonna be much more likely to respond to that. And when we think about, you know, there's, we could, there's our students across the board, some are enjoying this time as far as like they're feeling, they're liking the pace and a lot of them are struggling with, with the pace and just the, the new ways of doing it. But the, the one thing that you, everybody can still feel comfortable rolling, you know, like um, snuggling up on a couch or on a bed, reading a book, everybody can still put some words in, words on paper and even more so now, I think we need to, you know, think about writing, not just responding to literature, obviously, but also just re using writing and words as a way to express how we're feeling and, and um, or escape how we're feeling for that matter. Um, so I think that, yeah, a lot of the foundations that we've had set in place as a school have been really helpful. And I also think the culture of our staff, the idea that we've built this work together, we talked a little bit about that last week. Um, you know, we, um, we built this work modeling it for each other, growing it together. Um, it's been a real collaborative effort. So when we're trying to tackle this, every teacher has to start from their own comfort zone. So everybody's class looked very different the first couple of weeks and it still looks fairly different. But I think what you'll start to see if you peek into our online classes over the next couple of weeks, the next month, the classes are gonna to start to look more and more alike because people are just, they're going to steal best practices. They're asking for the help. They're, they're asking to sit in on each other's classes that are live or watch the stuff that other class, you know, classes are producing. So I think that it's that the culture of literacy is really been an incredible foundation, but the culture of collaboration and trust within the staff has been, um, you know, has been, a, has been helpful and really just what's keeping us going at this, at this point. I loved how you said that the, the books are doing this social emotional work that's so critical for kids right now. And I think that the collaboration of your staff is also doing social emotional work for them and helping them kind of mitigate the trauma of being forced out of their room and into the world alone at your desk, trying to do some kind of work with students. You know, the very fact that they would say, can I come watch your class online and figure out what I could take from that. Um, I am in my office and in the other room is my daughter who is working with her fifth graders. And she started screencasting so she could model writing for them. Screencasting the model of her writing. And I was like, wow, right? But I wouldn't know to do that unless I had a chance to glimpse in at what she was doing and then could ask her, like, how did you do that? And so that web that you created in that staff, that your staff created together is sustaining them right now. Yeah. And, and on that note, I think one of the great things that's happening is kind of combining this idea of the culture of collaboration and the culture of literacy. There are some teachers that are just sharing with another teacher and saying, I'm doing this and the teacher knows what that looks like in the classroom already because they're doing it because right. it's a practice we have and saying, oh, you know, like, wow, uh, duh, but of course we should be doing that because we usually do that. And oh, there is a way to do that digitally. Oh, great, show me. So it's, again, it's building on all of the work, you know, that we've done um, as well. And that, that bleeds into the other aspects of uh, just outside of literacy, just the culture of having an advisory system where every young person has an adult that is, that cares for them and having strong counselors. So. Um, we asked, we had, early, we had conferences early on, like just family conferences the first week of school or the second week of this, where we just asked every advisor to reach out and there are about seven or eight questions and a lot of it just kind of came out organically that we had to check in on our families to see how they were doing um, emotionally, physically, what were the needs. We have some, and we've experienced some loss already in our community. We have a lot of parents that are essential workers now. So the, the, the life of a young person who's worried, I spoke, I just was on the phone for 30 minutes about right before this with this young man who, a young boy who's already struggling a little bit with, with work. He's got two younger siblings at home. His mother has gone out to work, had the virus, came back, and now is back to work as an essential worker. So he's worried about his own health. He's worried about his siblings. He wasn't so focused to begin with all this happened. Um, so there's just a lot of work. So we made a plan individually with him that the teachers came up with. I shared, I spoke with it, with him about it, but having all, and that happened because the teacher reached out to the child had, you know, and the parent was able to communicate, understand, and we're bringing back this information and then you know, putting in customized individual plans for, for different young people. Um, so that work, again, it's having systems in place in the school that we're, you know, that are caring for young people in, in the way that they need to care for. And then, you know, we, you could get into the whole, so just, I mean, all the, the class and racial inequities that are happening now, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that in New York City. Um, so how do you, you, you know, how do you 
digest that and you can't turn back 500 years of racism or, you know, 50 years of policies and school systems or the city that have, you know, that have ex exploited or, or um, underserved certain young people. But at the moment, when you're recognizing how they're playing out in the most you know, in the most severe, serious situations, um, having a community that is really committed to doing what I would say anti-racist work, anti-classist work, um, social justice work as at the, the forefront of our, our mission has been, has been really powerful. So you see that playing out obviously in the equity around trying to get the reading work going, but you see it in just the way um, our, our staff members are reaching out to their families and our families are looking out for each other too. We have certain families who are just fortunate enough to be in a certain situation, whether they've historically been that way or they find themselves there now and really kind of pulling them together. So I know I'm going off a little bit, but I, when I think about this work, um, it's, it's just so, you know, it's so hard. Like that's why the literature and the reading and writing work is so rich because it's so connected to the real world and the real experiences. So it's hard to talk about that without rececognizing um, yeah, what our family is going through. And then our, our, our teachers that are doing the supporting work, they have their own family members that are sick or they're trying to homeschool their kids in the next room. And, um, and each of those families have their own issues. I, I, what I've been writing regular updates to my community and I, in one of my most recent letters, I just shared that we have 700 families, 800 if we include our teachers and each one of those 800 families have 800 extremely different circumstances and those circumstances are changing daily, even hourly. So to, to manage that, um, that's hard enough in a, when you get to see each other every day. And, you know, you, um, so under these circumstances, it's, it's been pretty daunting. But again, getting back to this idea that having created a community where the, the teachers really buy into the work that we're doing because they've created it and owned it and really care about young people, um, I, feel fortunate, I, feel, I feel very fortunate and blessed. I think our, our young people are, are fortunate and blessed at, at this time to, you know, all things considered. I would agree. They are fortunate to be in that community, but I also think that um, individual teachers are struggling so much with what does distance learning look like? What is, you know, my uh, co-grandmother down the road from me, she teaches high school English and she's reached out to kids and said, I want to confer with you still on your writing. And she gets about 40% of them or less who say, yeah. And then those conferences are powerful. She's learning a ton. They're learning a ton but there's a whole group of kids who are not reaching out. And I think that we're all worried about that. The inequities that you talked about, but just the, like Kelly, we were talking about this this morning. You don't have all your kids on. No, I have probably, if you combine my classes, I'm probably interacting with about 40% of my students. So I'm still missing. 60% of them and I'm still reaching out here and trying this avenue and trying now I'm going through advisors and coaches and counselors you know we're all trying to find kids a lot of our kids uh, I, I teach in a school that um, kids move around a lot so yeah. I'm not even sure some of them are still in the community some of them have gone back to Mexico some of them have um, uh, I don't know, disappeared. So I, I share this concern hugely that this is an event that is going to widen the gap on kids who uh, need more time, not less time. Yeah. Um, I was I was on an early morning run this morning and I drove by, a, I, wrote, I ran by a bus. The bus was going much faster than I am. I don't run so fast, but uh, I looked on the side of the bus and it had, this was an ad that came out before, before all of, um, the virus stuff, but it was basically a picture of a young um, young boy, and it said 40% of of students living in poverty will enter the school system below, you know, behind. And I think it might have been for one of the 3K or pre-K program. I didn't even get a chance, but it stood out to me. Uh, and you know, so if we think about that, we think about a lot of the young people that are coming to our schools behind, you know, fall behind over the years, or we, we're worried about them because of, you know, in many cases the inequities that exist. Um, well beyond their control uh and then so at this time yet yeah, like we this is only heightened that you know and i think it's i think it's our job as educators to do our best to reach out and to connect um but in one of our teachers shared something that i thought was a pretty it was a pretty quick but thoughtful observation she said you know usually in my classroom assuming everybody's there you know if somebody's absent you know that they're absent and we're, we we follow up but within the classroom you kind of, you tend to notice more, I think it's because of our high expectations, you know, you notice the students who aren't doing the right thing as a teacher, you know, you're always trying to do more, you know, you're never fully satisfied, you know, you're celebrating and you're excited about what 
students that are, that are succeeding are doing, but you always kind of have your extra eye on. So you walk out of the classroom that day, that class or at the end of the day, and you notice the kids that weren't living up to your expectations or needed more help. And you, your mind goes there. How am I going to support them? Sure. How am I going to push the other kids and help them? Um, but during the, the early days when this happened, um, and similar to what you're saying, Kelly, where you had a 60% of people maybe show up for something or even show up live or just producing work, you tend to notice more the, the, the people who are participating and, and performing, that's in your face. You're getting all of that. The data that you're not getting is seeing the students struggling. So you know that they're absent either because they're not handing something in or they're, they're literally not like showing up, but you don't have the same grit. So it's, it's a complete, um, it's, it's a reverse, it's, a, it's a just a, it's a harder way of looking at it. So a lot of our work from the beginning is, you know, how do we grab those kids, track those students down? As you shared, you know, there are some students obviously who you, you may not even know where they are in, in certain communities, which is beyond troubling and sadding. Uh, but, yeah, but a lot of this work early on is, yeah, how do we make it and how do we get those students in? You know, we're trying to do live classes more and more. But can certain kids not get on because they're helping their siblings with work at that time? Or, you know, even though we've gotten them another laptop, their Wi-Fi is slow or, you know. So I think all of these things that we've, all the, yeah, all these inequities that we've dealt with in the past are becoming, are harder to deal with, uh, you know, when you don't have access to kids every, every single day. Yeah, and I, I would piggyback on what Penny said because it's, it's hard under normal circumstances, but teachers now are, and I'm one of them, it's put in an untenable position because it's almost a paradox. Uh, these kids who are behind need more, but these kids who have life's biggest problems need less at a time, you know? And right. as a teacher, how do you balance that, that knowledge that they need more reading and writing with the knowledge that you can't really pile it on them because, you know, they're couch surfing or they're homeless or, you know, they're, they don't have, they've got bigger problems than senior English. Right. And in some ways, I hope that as a country, as a nation, you know, obviously there's going to be a lot of change um, probably around government, but um, you know, it, this will, once we're all through this, and I think we will get through this, uh, you know, we will be able to, I think we'll look at these issues a little bit, maybe closer, hopefully. I think um, we're also seeing a lot of compassion. We're seeing people look out for each other in a way um, that, you know, we, you know, that feels special too. So I think that, there are some hopefully positive things that will come out of this. I mean, we're going to be hurting for a while. The inequities will last longer, especially, you know, the economic inequities. But hopefully we can look back and kind of see how did we get here in the first place? You know, and I see people already writing about that, people raising questions. I think it's really important. We have a few teachers doing a, a, a talk around. There was a piece in the Times about um, the America we should have, I think, from the editorial board. I think that's called what's called, but just kind of like some of the history behind how we get got where we are, we are. Um, and I do think that it's really, I think it's presenting a special opportunity for us to, if not, you know, again, we have to live now and really try to pull as many people in and, and serve every kid, but it's also presenting the opportunity to have these conversations um, down the road. Um, it's also what it is presenting, and again, you could connect this, again, to storytelling in so many ways, but the opportunity for, for families to really be heard, like families that also may not be heard. So, you know, some families you have to, in certain cases, maybe track down or find a good time to speak with them. And But for the most part, we've really been able to connect with almost every single one of our families right now. And just having the advisor or the teacher or the counselor or the school leader reach out and talk to the student and the parent. And we, we have these conversations already. These are not things that we don't do, but there's such a level. I think we're all just turning up our empathy and our compassion button. And it's not about like, where's the work or I haven't seen, you know, we're just, starting with how are you doing you know how's it going what do you need um it's okay to need saying what our own needs are you know me talking about how i'm struggling with my son and you know and trying to help him focus during this time um sharing the stories without exposing who it is sharing the stories of other people letting them know that other families are struggling with this and i think we are really going through a time where we're really taking a minute to, to hear family stories and student stories it would be great if we can get that in get students to write more about that as we get down the road and really use that as a way, as a therapeutic way, as well as a, a way to, you know, to, to have students' voices heard. But it's, it's, so I think, again, I think that's going to change. And not just, I think a school like ours that has been doing that work already, I think we're realizing, again, how powerful that is and how we can become even better at that. And I think schools that are doing that for the first time, people are really reaching out and talking to parents and hearing kids and parents and, and getting beyond the, you know, the surface level 
of what they're seeing every day or, you know, saying, oh, maybe they're not saying kids are making excuses, but not really empathizing. I think by hearing student stories and family stories, it's going to change a lot of educators. Um, you know, we're going to be more tired after all this, but they're going to be ready to listen after this. And I, I, so I feel, again, I think that's something that, that's really hopeful that's going to come out of all this. That's so you, Mark, to give us the hopeful end. I love that. <laughs> Can I ask one last little nuts and I'm a Met fan. I mean, this is, you know, <laughs> hope is my life. Disappointment is awesome. <laughs> That's a good can point. I ask, can I ask a nuts and bolts question? Please, please. So if I'm an English teacher at your school, how often do I see my classes? Yeah, it really, at this point, it ranges. Uh, I think the, the goal that we're trying to get at, and that is a couple times, two times a week, is a reasonable goal at this point as far as your whole class and some teachers are combining blocks together because they can deliver because I have some teachers that have two or three kids that they're taking care of at home and I have other teachers who sure. you know have maybe parents and other people that have a little bit more time and they're looking out for each other um, so probably we're looking at two live classes a week is kind of the the goal here and then a lot of individual like we have a lot of learning specials. We have about 28% of our students have IEPs in the school. So we have a lot of learning specials on each grade. Each English teacher, each English team on each grade has their own learning specialist. So, and then plus the reading specialists and others, um, we have speech and hearing, um, speech and language therapists. So they're doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one work as well as teachers are offer, offering office hours. So as far as a whole class time, we're looking at the ideal of, you know, really trying to, if we can get two days a week, we feel that's better, maybe a little bit more for the younger grades. Uh, but then this one-on-one -on -one office hour time and independent time. And then the advisory time is also really important because that's face time. So you'll teach not all your advice, you'll teach all your advisors, but all your advisees are in your class. But that's, a, again, a lot of the face time that really matters right now. Is, and some of that is just playing games and doing fun, silly stuff. But it's, it's nothing. Um, and then I think I'm hoping that may, you know, now we're here for three months. I, I'm hoping that if that we can grow that. And I think now it's also, what I'm saying now is because at first it felt a little unfair to just put so much stuff on the live stuff so much um, energy in the live things, partially because teachers were figuring it out, but also until we knew that every student had access and we knew student schedules. So now we're working on setting up individual students who are struggling with getting to live things or showing up for a counseling appointment or a speech appointment. We're getting them individual schedules and going over those with the parents and the kids. Some kids are sleeping, they're, they're, they're like night owls, you know, they're staying up all night. And so we're really trying to regulate those schedules now and we're hoping that that, um, that will allow more kids to come on live and more kids to, take advantage of the services that, that are being offered as well. I love that. So um, I want to end with a book talk for you, Mark. I don't know if you know Not Light But Fire. Do you know this book? I've seen it, but I don't know. Yeah, so tell me about it. Well, I was so struck when I was in your school that you have a mission from grades 6 through 12 that kids will be able to enter these conversations which, with other kids, small group conversations, accountable talk, the way you talk about we want to see growth every year. Well. Matt is brilliant at dialogic conversations about really tough things. There's a chapter in here called um, The N-Word that will blow you away with the smart, smart thinking about how to approach it with kids. And he looks at, I mean, several are in-depth looks at how to run a conversation that's difficult, but a lot of it's just the thinking about the power of talk and the power of changing systems just like you're engaged in he's our guest tomorrow oh so i guess so. you know that you could listen to him but also it's a book so well worth knowing i think i'll do both so that's great no that thank you and um yeah and i and i think that's such a big part of what we need to do now is just share share ideas and you know and collaborate and learn you know just learn from each other so thanks well, for thank continuing you. to set this up Thank you, Mark, for sharing your ideas. It's very refreshing to see uh, an administrator, a leader who gets the literacy piece. Um, I'll even say it publicly. I haven't had a leader who really, really gets the literacy piece for a long, long, long time. And so uh, it's refreshing to hear you. And I hope, uh, I hope your message really resonates with those who are, who are watching us. Thank you. And um, I can't say enough. You keep doing what you're doing. I'm in awe of both of you and appreciate your work. So keep it up. I will be tuning into your checking on your Padlet and, and following you throughout oh, this time. Mark, we okay. will meet again when this we is definitely. over. Shelter we well. We yes. Back at you. Be well. Thanks for having me again. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thanks everybody, for joining us. And Thanks, see you tomorrow when, we, uh, when we'll talk with Matt Kay. Woohoo!